Thanks. Welcome, everybody. This is our study session, Spokane City Council. I'm Lori Kinnear, Council Member Pro Tem, and we have three council members here in person, and we're waiting for two more to show up, but we're going to go ahead and get started. We like to start on time. We have three items on our agenda, and the first person up is going to be Carl Otterstrom from STA. He's going to talk about STA Connect, the 2035 strategic plan. Welcome, Mr. Otterstrom. Thanks for coming down. Thank you, Council Member Kinnear and members of the City Council. Can we have you adjust that so you're, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Great. So thank you so much for the opportunity to, to present to you and discuss and receive your input on STA's efforts to develop its Connect 30, 2035 strategic plan. And uh, just as we've gone around, I've gone around the, the region, I've shared with everyone that uh, STA is your public transportation system. And that's uh, particularly the case with the city of Spokane. We've had transit in the city dating back 135 years and that uh, STA is of that lineage. And um, we, over the last year, uh, all those present are members of the STA Board of Directors and so you're very familiar with the effort of phase one strategic foundation which uh, the out was the outcome of our first phase of Connect 2035 strategic planning. Um, so this strategic plan, we're looking at uh, what is in the future for transit over the next 10 years. And the first phase that we completed last year uh, developed uh, the uh, revised agency's mission statement and vision statement and developed goals, strategies, and some headline performance measures uh, that would guide us in the second phase of the plan which will officially kick off next month. And in that phase will be, and I'll talk more about this today, identifying, evaluating, prioritizing the program of projects and actions and initiatives that we take on and uh, continue extensive community engagement. So recapping our first phase of the planning effort, we uh, interviewed uh, a number of STA board, all the STA board members as well as 27 community leaders uh, from various organizations, uh, both nonprofit, governmental, uh, educational. Uh, we had an online survey receiving feedback on what's important to, to our bus riders and the community with 849 participants, held six listening sessions, uh, and uh, held other uh, uh, activities at some of the summer events last year. The listening sessions included us going to organizations and actually uh, having them invite their constituents uh, and ensuring that to ensure that we had good participation, we actually paid people for their time or worked with the organization to pay uh, or, or reimburse in some fashion for their time. We also held four STA Board of Director workshops and uh, had employee engagement activities uh, there in that picture in the bottom left in our garage with the beautiful city line bus in the background. So what we heard from people, um, especially the bus riders, they want buses that come more often. That's the number one priority. It wasn't a shocker to us. It's been something we've been working on for a long time. But it also it's, it's comes up in our regular uh, surveys of our, our bus riders. Uh, also, people want us to go to new places. Where else can we serve? What other places and destinations aren't served by transit today? They also want us to have service all hours of the week and better, you know, more times during the week, nights and weekends. And then uh, this came out really out of the uh, interviews with community leaders was seeing STA, want to see STA as a leader in sustainability and climate change issues. So they updated the vision statement, connecting everyone to opportunity, uh, that replaced uh, the older uh, vision statement, which was to aspire to be a source of pride for the region. Of course, we, I think we still aspire to do that, but uh, this is more clearly focused on our, what we do as a, a transit agency is connecting. So our mission statement uh, was updated, and, and the key point there was adding the word inclusive. So the plan has three goals. Uh, goal one, elevate the customer experience. The so second goal, lead and collaborate with community partners to enhance the quality of life in our region. And the third goal, strengthen our capacity to anticipate and respond to the demands of the region. So the first goal has four strategies. 
expanding and adapt, uh, adapt to mobility options to attract and serve more people. Second strategy, advanced frequent, easy to use, fast and reliable service. Third, deliver an outstanding door-to-door -door experience. And uh, most of our service is not door-to-door, -door, but the experience of riding transit is a door-to-door -door experience, right? You leave the house, did I miss the bus already? How do I get there? What's the trip planner say? Do I have, you know, do I have my fare? And so that experience, how do we, how do we ensure from each end of that it's, it's a great experience? And finally, uh, create a welcoming, comfortable, and, and secure environment for all customers. Goal two, lead and collaborate with community partners to enhance the quality of life in our region. Uh, collaborate to enhance access to transit. Uh, what does that look like? That's ensuring uh, we're working together on uh, prioritizing sidewalk improvements, pedestrian safety things to get people to bus stops. Uh, supporting community partners to amplify community benefits. We've got lots of great transit service where people already are. How do we make sure that they have a bus pass in their hand? How do we make sure that there is, uh, it's, it's promoted and, and uh, uh, enhanced at their organizations? And the third, proactively initiate partnerships to promote and help employers, service providers, and residential development to locate near high-frequency transit. It's one of the reasons we have been involved uh, in the conversations about housing, uh, we've uh, wrapped that up recently, but Brian Jennings, the Deputy Director for Community Development here, and one of his roles is on really driving transit-oriented development, both what STA can do and what we can help our partners do. Third goal, strengthen our capacity to anticipate and respond to the demands of the region. This develop, prepare, prepare, and empower our team members. This speaks to how do we ensure that the professional team Drivers, everyone feels empowered to do their job and has the tools and resources to do that. Secondly, engage in proactive assessment and planning and deliver strategic long-term investments most beneficial to our communities. And the third, exemplify financial stewardship to maintain public trust and organizational sustainability. And as you know, STA has uh, basically forever been a debt-free organization and that has positioned it to be able to be strategic and uh, and long-term in our thinking and, and actions. Uh, the overall project schedule is shown here on this slide and uh, again, beginning in July, this phase two effort, continuing until the end of next year. Just a few highlights, you know, it's, these, these charts can be a little hard to read sometimes or, or uh, too much information, but just the highlights is community engagement, is shown throughout. There's some green areas where we're saying this is where we're really going to hit it heavier. And then um, there's kind of a, a waterfall of activities when it comes to uh, initial efforts and in understanding some baseline funding assumptions and our comprehensive capacity analysis. And that's going to be a review of our the staff uh, interviews, assessment, our capabilities, what, what's missing in our capabilities, our tools or resources the fixed route network assessment, looking, having a, a third party as part of the, the team um, look at our, the effectiveness of our system, what's missing, uh, what's, what's working well. And then uh, working with the board and the community and developing an, a list of initiatives. Those could be new projects, policy changes, programs, other activities that drive uh, success and the goals uh, for the next 10 years. Evaluating uh, that with criteria that are developed and then ultimately put, pulling that into a plan based on you know, refining that list and filtering it based on evaluation uh, criteria. So uh, our goal today, uh, in sharing this with you, uh, is to uh, ask some questions of you. So many of you have already have provided feedback over the last many months, but it's another opportunity, and we've actually, uh, earlier this spring, we presented to uh, Mayor Woodward and her, her cabinet uh, and got feedback from them. And uh, you're the last of all the jurisdictions we've spoken to. We were uh, scheduled initially in April. But these four questions, I'll read all four of them, but uh, I'd like to take the rest of our time and, and hearing your feedback and taking notes and uh, helping us as we craft with our consultants, Sam Schwartz Engineering, uh, all the, the action plan for each of the steps and, and outreach activities. So the four questions, how do you see these goals and the strategies aligning with the city's priorities for the next 10 years? What opportunities do you see for the city and STA to collaborate in the next 10 years? 
How would you like to participate in phase two of Connect 2035 and what public engagement strategies have worked well with your citizens? And that last question, we've got a lot of good input from the different jurisdictions around the community, the region uh, that, will, you know, our, uh, tactics are different around the region and it's really helpful to hear. So, okay. that. Thank you. So, uh, here's our chance, folks, to um, bombard Carl with questions because we know there's some challenges right now with um, driver shortages and so forth. So, uh, who wants to start off? Go ahead. Well, Carl, no, I'll go straight to my standard question about community engagements, uh, the BIPOC community, really, how, how depth was that outreach and inclusiveness and what we struggle with here is language access uh, to get that information to the writers as they go. So I guess I'm ha asking three questions. So just answer whichever way you want. And then of course we look at transit development as well and really how much closer do we need to be working with STA or STA with the city as we plan our growth, because there's some areas that are growing. As you know, we hear a lot from the 195 corridor. So there are pockets of our community that don't have public transportation um, that continues to bubble up. And how can we work together to meet that need? Yeah, so as, as far as outreach, that's a, a particular emphasis in our outreach plans, and uh, at least how we've scoped them. With, and now, as the consultants come on board next month, We'll be driving home that point. Mm -hmm. uh, we did get some great feedback actually from uh, the mayor's staff, cabinet level staff on some of the things that have worked well. Uh, and uh, going, for instance, Marshall Lee speakers mm -hmm. going to their events, right, which are often in the parks mm -hmm. uh, and hearing from them. Uh, language access, we do uh, provide translation at events. Now, how do we make sure that we, we um, kind of proactively provide it rather than wait for somebody to request. I think that's, that would be something we can explore in this stage. So uh, kind of mixing uh, what I hear both you're asking, how did we do it well and how are you gonna make sure we do it even better right. in the next phase? So. Can I ask you, you know, when, on the front of the buses when you know they're, it's just re going across bus with park and ride, could that be in a different language as it goes across the front of the buses? And then we have English, could it be in Spanish as it's talking about what the next destination could be? And that's just off the top of my head, Carl, so you can get back with me on that later. Sure, we can, uh, I could get back to you on that. Uh, Council Member Wilkerson, I lost track of all the questions you asked. Oh, sorry, so I Did I he know. answer all of them? Is what I haven't yet, no. He answered all of them, and thank you, Carl. Well, TOD, I think you brought up TOD. Right. And I think that's something, again, uh, and part of this plan and having it elevated as a strategy uh, is, is really exciting. Um, the board in 2021 did set aside some funding to do a pilot with transit-oriented development and actually acquire some properties. And so, again, back to Brian Jennings' role. Uh, he formerly was with the Spokane Housing Authority. His new role, he's going to be helping us acquire property for both transit purposes outright, as well as how do we leverage this to, to integrate with uh, planning efforts by the city. And I do meet with, and, and uh, Brian and I both meet with uh, Spencer Gardner on a regular basis. And Great. so we're really trying to integrate that at the Great. ground level. Thank you. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah. Um, so with, so t two things. One, first on that, that point, uh, are you going to be looking, especially at those places like we've discussed in the past where you know, the central city line disrupted a front yard and like that property could have been a viable option for, for some other use related to transit. Is, is that kind of what you're thinking that if you're gonna be disrupting anyway that you would do something more substantive? Uh, I think part of the strategy will be to flesh that out. I think there, there are, uh, you know, uh, seated by your comments or question uh, years ago at this point, we have actually talked about this. Uh, Wellesley is probably one yep. of the best examples because our bus stops, we, we aren't able to put shelters and improvements on Wellesley because there's no right of way to do that. And if, to get more right of way will require basically being in somebody's front yard mm -hmm. within inches of their, their front windows. And so that, that's potentially an opportunity to look at those, those kind of edge cases of stops as an opportunity to, to invest in, 
and Perfect. potentially you know redevelop for uh, multifamily housing. Yeah, I, th I think that's the, the smart way to go about it. Uh, and then the second question, uh, to piggyback on, on Councilman Wilkerson, uh, the pockets of folks that are underserved, and uh, again, we've discussed this in the past, El Estero, uh, uh, the uh, low-income uh, complex there in, um, I guess it's kind of in the Logan neighborhood, but they uh, you know, obviously still would love to have service, and we've discussed the challenges there. But at one point, you were talking about a hybrid midway model where you would have sort of a van that could take folks when there is these large gaps in accessibility to a bus stop, the van could come pick them up and essentially just take them to the bus stop. So, and they're, they're about one mile door to bus stop where they're at. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't say enough about strategy 1.1 here, expand and adapt mobility options to attract and serve more people. So part of this is not just looking, how do we expand bus routes, but how do we expand mobility options? So there are, that's an example, a lot of the 195 corridor area where the topography is such, the road network is very challenging for people to access a fixed route bus, would be opportunities to explore, you know, something that is app-based, that takes you to a transit hub, then you're able to, to take transit across the region at that point. Okay. So that's, that is on kind of on the docket for exploring. Still working that. Okay, awesome, yep. thank you. Yeah, and I'll also point out we did get a, a, a grant a few years ago, uh, which has been on the back burner uh, for actually looking at five mile park and ride as a mobility hub, kind of a, a test pilot, at least not, not to implement, but to explore the planning of that. So it's, just, it's a small grant, but okay. uh, we hope to be doing the RFP later this summer. Great. Uh, Council Member Sapone or Bingle, any questions? Yeah, well, or, or some of your questions that you asked yes. us that we didn't really answer. <laughs> um, I think a big one that we talked about a lot at the city is trying to do density here in the city and encouraging people to build up that transit oriented development. Um, but I just came from like the housing um, subcommittee that we have here and their struggle is accessibility, I guess, is part of it. I, I mean, it's stuff that you've seen in other, um, <coughs> uh, other outreach you've done, but also just like convenience factor and time it takes to get places continues to be a struggle for people. Someone said like, I work downtown, my kid is out towards the valley, it takes two hours to go with connections and like that's not feasible to, to take mm -hmm. the bus to go get them from school. And so um, that's one example, but I hear that frequently as people worried about that. Um, and then the tenants union um, and other renters were definitely advocating for a need for a low income fare um, or fares based on income and the need um, we're, we're also having discussions about parking and trying to reduce the number of parking in our city, which relies on transit as kind of that follow through. And so people were like, well, we can't address our parking at the city until it's more convenient to take transit. So that's one of the areas I think um, that to collaborate for the next 10 years. That's great. Um, I, I've got a question. It's just a logistics. So if you, get a smaller van taking somebody or people to a hub, how do you make that an efficient use of time? Because, I mean, I'm just doing it in my head, loading people on a van, getting it to the hub, unloading them, getting them back on another bus to take them to wherever they're gonna go, that's a time suck. And the whole point is people want uh, convenience and efficiency and they, they wanna get to their destination in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time. So how do you logistically do that? And would there be alternatives such as using smaller buses to get, where, where there's infrastructure doesn't allow the bigger buses, to just don't bother with the hub, just go from point A to point B, skip the hub. So that's my. Yeah, so, so the transit agencies have been exploring this uh, in, in the state of Washington. Uh, the system in uh, uh, the Tri-Cities, they have a less mature transit systems. So they, they've actually started, started this program um, uh, with, with uh, uh, vans. And, and basically, the, the, it's been successful even feeding into their hubs uh, because the travel time or the wait time is really low on those, those, those shuttles. Uh, but the cost is tremendously higher than, so our, our cost 
pre-pandemic was about $5 a ride, six, now it's about $10, $11 a ride in terms of lower ridership, we're almost back to 80%, and then of course inflation. But those costs per ride in the $5 to $12 range are uh, really efficient and the systems, these, these kind of on demand, even when they're sharing a ride, is, is in the $50 to $80 a person or a trip. And so there's an opportunity cost like, well, in the end, are we just providing an Uber or Lyft? Or are we pr providing public transportation? And so finding that kind of balance. Uh, so in the case of the, the Tri-Cities, they, they at first they were offering people like kind of point to point. And people are love it, you know, especially because it was like $2 a ride. Well, that wasn't sustainable because it was, number, it was making this transit system, le rest of it, less efficient, but it also the cost of the demand was going to outstrip their ability to provide that service because it was basically a taxi that was $2. So that kind of being able to see that new mobility as an extension of the transit system to say this is when we get more people in the same vehicle, there's, this is, that's more of a sustainable mode. Um, even though an electric car is, takes less carbon fuel, but it still has uh, emissions effectively from the tires. It still creates um, congestion on the freeway if all these people are just one or two people in a car. So th all those things still point to the bigger buses. In addition to our major cost with, with fixed route is not the size of the bus, it's the operator and, and the people, which, which is good. That's, that's why transit has such a great economic uh, div, uh, benefit in terms of a multiplier effect because it is very people centric in, well, in terms I, of its operation. I, I would challenge that a little bit too. I mean, the ferry system is a huge money suck. It's part of our um, highway system in the state of Washington, but when you think about what it costs to run ferries back and forth between the islands, oh my goodness. So there, there has to be some kind of price point where we're serving the citizens. Um, and we're going to eat the costs. And after a while, people are going to get used to that. It's going to attract more people because it's more convenient. It's going to reduce congestion in our roads. So there's, there's going to be a point where it's going to be beneficial for everybody. And yeah, it's going to cost a little bit more, just like the ferry system does. So I'm just going to put that out there. Go ahead. Yeah. And, um uh, I, w I would just say, I mean, I, I agree. I, I would love to have a, a small bus serving El Estero tomorrow, obviously. Uh, I just want them to have access, and that's the only thing. But I think my thinking is the way this really makes sense to me is it would really just be a stopgap in those few areas, whatever you identify as being a priority, where you really have that missing yeah. piece of access to the bus. And so it, I, I think, you know, you're right. You have to balance everything out and make sure it all, all works. But you know, and again, I just come back to the El Estero case because it's 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 a little just frustrating. You know, they're they're one mile from the closest bus stop, and in the summer, you know, for those who are are mobile, it's not the biggest deal. But in the winter, it's really a hindrance for everybody who lives there. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of folks who are there who are disabled or have other challenges, and so having that mile gap is a challenge. And so, if there could be any intermediary or intermediate option. I would, I would take it for, for, their, for their benefit. Could but, you describe that? But a small that, bus would be great. Describe what that is a little bit. The El Estero? Yeah. It's just a, a, a complex, complex. Yeah, it's just a complex on uh, upriver, uh, just a, not too far from a vista that has a lot of very heavily subsidized and low income uh, individuals living there, many straight out of homelessness. Okay. Um, and so it's just a very challenging. Area there, and then next door to them is a, a senior uh, living, yeah. which is a higher income, a little higher area. But same thing. I mean, those folks would also like to have better okay. access to transit. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. And along that same road, I mean, you know, there's a new 84 house uh, uh, housing development right out there. Again, getting close to uh, the county city line out there. Um, there's another 168 units that are going to be going out there. Is that closer to Havana? That one, I'm looking at the map right now. Um, we, do, we do plan to have service next year extend along Frederick and Upper River Drive east of Green Street okay. in September of next year. So we're building bus stops right now. But, but that stretch, you know, that particular section between Green and Mission used to have bus service in the early 2000s. It was in the single digits a day, it was very low. Uh, so it speaks to kind of there are those stopgap areas where yeah. 
at that stage, you know, the bus isn't very efficient either. Um, and so being able to find, you know, those, those opportunities in between mm -hmm. is really helpful. Yeah, the one I'm talking about is right at the upriver dam, um, right there on upriver in Frederick. Um, yeah. That's right there. And there's another 168 going out there. And there's, and, there's, and the uh, Beau Rivage already has hundreds, and it's been, a, it's been an issue for a long time. Yeah. And so we're really excited. Uh, it was, for, for, for lack of drivers, postponed until next year, but it was initially we were going to have bus services mm -hmm. this year out there. Anybody else? Go ahead. I haven't said one word. I know. Now's your <laughs> chance. It's been very good. Um, <laughs> just real quickly, so I'm, I'm kind of with Councilmember Cathcart in that I know there have been a lot of concerns in, in District 3 about those areas that don't have access. And so I guess my thinking is I, I hope moving forward that um, there's some good, good um good ways for STA to reach out to those areas and to hear those voices and to bring them in to see what kind of solutions might be available. But that's really the biggest frustration that I hear. Um, then the next one usually is buses don't come fast enough. We want to get on and off, on and off. Um, we don't want to wait 20 minutes for a bus. Um, and I know that's in discussion and that's going to continue to be a discussion but my big priority would just be to be aware of those areas that don't have the service that are asking for it and that um, there's some way to have those discussions and invite those people in um, to talk about what else might work for them that's great feedback yeah. okay anybody else and this is not your last chance by the way to talk we know where he lives we know where you live, yeah. yes. Okay. We'll Carl, you thanks today. so much. Thank you so much, yeah. You'll hear more from me, i Appreciate sure. your time, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Next up thanks, Carl. is Strategic Initiative Funding, Tanya Wallace, Steve McDonald, Kim Orlob, and we have 20 minutes allotted for that, so uh, about noonish, give or take. Thank you, and Jacoby, are you gonna work that for me, or? Thank you. So, um, yes, council members, this was actually a request to bring forward to you an update um, on this um, historic, really historic um, strategic investment programming that was put together um, many, many years ago, almost a decade ago. Um, and it has continued on through this administration, and here we are. This was actually a request of council president Begs and it has taken many, many staff hours um, to reconcile this enormous and complex um, program that is multi-year, multi-department, and multi-millions of investments into the community. Um, I do want to just quickly introduce um, Kim Orlop, who is right there. She is one of our fantastic accounting managers that has been really the coordinator and overseeing um, the reconciliation and the tracking of all of these projects, all of these dollars um, that, that honestly takes, if I just had to guess, at least 100 hours of staff time every year to reconcile at the end of a closeout of a fiscal year and track to see where everything's at and check up with the project managers, the several project managers that are watching over these programs. Um, and we do have Spencer Gardner out there. Um, I'm not sure if we have the rest of the team, but there's many people involved in this. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the historical context, and then we're just gonna kind of walk through the status um, by category or focus area, mm -hmm. and then really talk about how we're gonna close this six years um, of investment programming um, by the end of 23. So next. This is not intended for you to really read all of those pictures up there, but it is very graphical to say there was a lot of work that went into this. It actually started um, as a joint collaborative um, effort between the city council and the executive branch in 2014, but it took years um, of work where by December of 2017, there was a draft. So you can see it was three years of hard work and collaboration to come up with what is this investment program going to look like. 
uh, for the community. And then at the end of the last administration, there was a two-year action plan that was approved. But if you can't really see very well, but on the top picture, it was not imagined that it would just stop with the two years of action plan, but that the, the Woodward administration would carry that through the next four years, and that's where we are today, is at the end of this um, really great strategy. So the funding strategy involved and looked at from that two-year action plan of almost $52 million of investment. So a lot of funding going into the community. So next. Again, not intended for you to see the details, but to see the colors. With the colors, it was the four key focus areas, um, innovative infrastructure, urban experience, safe and healthy and sustainable resources, which is exactly how the committees have been structured to focus around those areas. So the colors really do represent something very important. The columns that you see up there is the vast array of funding sources. So again, very complex, involves a lot of folks in the community and in the departments, and then leadership as well. So next. I'm going to just walk you through each of these areas, the four different colors, starting with innovative infrastructure, which had nearly $17 million in total going through that. And you can see everything that has been completed. There's almost $13 million of investments. A vast majority of these projects have been completed um, to date. The rest is encumbered. About $3 million is encumbered to move forward. I do want to point out um, one of the programs, the PDA Impact Fee Waiver, that is still the same original million dollars um, that it started with. It is still there. It is encumbered, um, and I do believe staff will be bringing forward the program that requires your approval so that we can then get that moving and making progress on that piece as well. Um, a few of those others that are encumbered are still pending, either matching, um, but there are agreements in place. There's just a few little ticks and ties that are still outstanding on those, um, but we do anticipate making some great strides in all of that. The variance that you see down at the bottom is really where funding, because we go budget and then we have actuals, in some cases not all of the funding was actually available or in some cases with some of the streets and utilities, it was grant funded, but the project came in under budget, so that's just the variance, the difference. Um, part of the funding sources too in a lot of this was the surplus of properties. So we had a target of how much proceeds we anticipated receiving from the sale of proceeds, proceeds from the sale of properties but sometimes that doesn't always materialize as you expect or the properties get um, redirected for other purposes. Looking at urban experience, this was a next category with 15.5 million anticipated for investment into these projects. And a vast majority of that is also completed. The Sportsplex uh, PFD funding of $5 million being the largest. And of course, we now get to enjoy that Sportsplex and all that it brings to the community. Um, and then many of those that are encumbered right now, another $3 million or so encumbered, um, is pending. But most of that we anticipate being completed by the end of 2023. Tanya, where are the, where are the dollars encumbered? At. Like, is there a fund that these sit in, a strategic initiative? They're in fund? multiple funds, actually. Okay. <laughs> That's what makes this a, a little bit complex. Sometimes they're in um, solid waste. Sometimes they're in sewer or water. Um, when it comes to, it might be in development services. It might be in streets. It depends okay. on the project. So it's across the board. But if, you, if there's something specific that you'd want, well, we will I, certainly dive I just, deeper we're, on that. We're, we're confident, though, that those dollars are, in fact, set aside and, and that they are there, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I would add it would be nice to have a list of where they are so we know. We can do that for you. Yep. 
Um, committed, these, now here there are not contracts, it's not encumbered, but it is still dedicated funding within the fund committed for these purposes that were originally agreed upon. And again, the variance is either the, the actual funding did not materialize, um, largely from grants or sale of surplus, or that's just the variance, the difference, the project was completed. Um, for example, let's say the trail, the, the trail river access improvement projects from REIT, the project just came in under budget, but it's completed. Go ahead. Whatever happened with the McKinley School? Still floating. Is it, is there anything going on there? About that was something? the CSO tank I think they're talking about. Is that, that the CSO tank? I think it's still in the works. It's just moving really slow. Okay. Because remember, we, we had to make right. a few comp plan changes and some stuff, yeah. and I think okay. that delayed But I think the whole. The, this is talking about the CSO. Okay. We had to delay because of the, the level of the aquifer that was right there, so you could only do construction certain times of, of okay. the year. Hmm. Okay. Tanya, the, sorry, yes, on the, sir. The, the RID path, um, Falls Tower, et cetera, um, when were those um, allocated or set aside? Was that going back kind of four or five years? I'm not sure, but we can get the answer okay. for you. What, asking f uh, about the loan or about the money that was given to? Well, just trying to understand the, the program that we're talking about, I guess. So remember we had that money that had Citywide. been sequestered for 15 years and it w could only be used for a specific purpose. And yeah. so when the investors came and asked for that, so the RID path could be um, reconfigured for really low income folks, it, we expected it would get paid back, but we weren't gonna hold our breath. Right. And it, the RID path is still has a ways to go yeah. to get that. But they're going to come for these dollars, though, at some point? Is that? Potentially. I mean, these were all done in that same time frame when this was all put together. And so um, th those are set aside. You'll see another one that also had the Falls Tower for a $10,000 sewer yeah. improvement. That's in a developer agreement that's outstanding. So if that moves ahead uh, in the timeline of the contract, that still is available. But, it, you know, it's, so there's individual contracts for some of these things that could expire or have different changes. So it's not necessarily something that... At, at some point after five or six years, developer agreements tend to expire. So yeah. those things may need to be renegotiated or they may no longer be valid. Okay. So safe and healthy, a majority of this is, is really completed and we anticipate all of these projects to, to be completed by the end of 2023 for sure. The largest one there is the public safety equipment and vehicles that was funded through SIP loan proceeds. Um, and then I think the one that council president specifically has questions on is that homeless available and affordable housing. And um, that was really started with about 2 million anticipated from um, REIT funding. But at the time, REIT is not eligible for that. So the general fund put in the 2 million and REIT went to for streets projects, and we just pulled two million from streets and put it over here. So either way, still two million for that specific project. Most of it has been spent over that time frame. The remainder of that specific amount is that 961,000 that you see that is encumbered and is contracted with um, Habitat for Humanity and Truth in Ministries, and has been for, for some time over that duration. And is that where the first million went then, was to those two organizations? Those two organizations, and I believe about three or four other organizations, but we can certainly send you those details as well, and you can see exactly when and how much to those organizations. And, and so there's nine, 961 left. What, what is the, I guess, what's, what's the agreement with those organizations? What, what's, what would they be coming back to us to request next, I guess? Well, there is a contract in place, so they would not necessarily be coming back to council for a request of any kind. There's 805,000 encumbered and contracted with Habitat for Humanity um, for one of their programs, and then um, 156,000 encumbered with Truth Ministries. Okay, so, so they're it's, contracted. It's, yeah, if they come forward, if they bring their reimbursement request for funding that follows those contracts, then we will 
provide that funding to them. Okay. And it does seem to be a little bit of a trickle on that. Um, we do anticipate uh, the SEPTED projects to be completed by the end of this year. One of the projects that we actually did up there, the 118, was redo that, that corner by the multimodal mm -hmm. center, um, particularly with the, the area asking for a lot to be done with that corner. So we've done a lot of really great work there. And then the utility assistance program is moving along and we have the new UIS system, so there's a lot more work that can be done there. Again, you can see the variance is um, lack of funding from surplus property. And then lastly, sustainable resources. All of this has basically been committed, and I will sell, say the general fund reserves is the largest component of that. So we did stand up those reserves from 1819 and add the two and a half million. But under the Woodward administration, particularly in 21, we actually shored those up and hit those targets of the 10% and the 3.5%. Um, so a lot of really great work there. Spencer is, or Mr. Gardner, is working on finishing up that sub-area planning for the Monroe area, and then this one will also be closed out by the end of 23. Really on next steps, this, this is just really a summary of all those projects that are in progress that we're tracking right now from those different focus areas. Um, and you can see the total amount, 8.7 million. So just from my own perspective, I think the city has done a really great job of, of investing over $50 million into the community over these last six years given a pandemic and the slowdown and everything that has disrupted the progress of this. Um, our ultimate goal um, is to clean these up, as, as um, Marlene pointed out, review these contracts, see how they move forward, but ultimately to not be tracking them. It takes a whole lot of staff administrative time to track them under this model, but really to reaffirm pending projects um, and make reallocation suggestions if we find that the funding is there, we can unencumber and move forward with other priorities of the city. Go ahead. If, yeah, just one, one more thing. It would be great to have, uh, not to put more on your plate, but just in the con in, as we discuss budget stuff, it would be great to just have a column that shows, you know, kind of when, when the pending status would conclude so we, we will know for sure that the money is going to be spent or not so that we can kind of account for, you know, what, what might be possible, whether it's this year or, you know, a year down the road. But I think that would be uh, just helpful to have that as a column on that list. Councilmember yes. Bingle? Uh, yeah, the Beacon Hill development here, the water booster, the, the pending um, of this 800,650 has already gone out. Is that correct for the, for the booster station out there? I don't have the answer to that. Is, I thought it was 450. Marlene, is that what we were talking about yesterday? Don't start talking to you in the microphone. <laughs> the Beacon Hill developer agreement is a total of $800,000, 650 for the booster station and 150 for the tank. Um, if it's possible we haven't paid it out yet, gotcha. um, but I believe that booster station bill is coming, uh, yeah. and then we have the discussion about the tank. They haven't right. gotten that far yet. So that is, um, so I'd have to double check and see if that was included. I'm not seeing Beacon Hill on this it's list. The second one down. Oh, yeah. So, so, that, so 650 of that 800 is the booster station, 150 is the tank. The tank, right. So okay. obviously pending because I, I believe the booster station is done or close to done, so we would do that on a reimbursement. Okay. And then the other 150 we kind of have in limbo at this point. So. Yeah. Any other questions? I do. Um, oh, I'm sorry, are you, is that it? Is there more? Yes, that is it. Okay. So... Um, Councilmember Stratton and I were actually there when all this happened. I have a different memory of how this unfolded. Um, it was very much a collaborative effort, and Rick Romero led the charge to create the strategic plan along with um, Teresa Sanders at the time and Amber Waldorf. It was very much a collaborative effort. It was intended to end at the end of the Condon administration and not continue. And some of us council members said, that's probably not how we want to go. We've spent so much time 
working on this and getting this, and, and there was a lot of, you remember, mm -hmm. the, it was not easy, there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of um, testiness around getting this because we didn't necessarily all agree. And so we did agree, however, that if you ended this after all this hard work at the end of the Condon administration, then we'd have to start all over again. So the agreement was, let's review this and update it every two years and see where we're at. Well, that didn't happen, and I can. And it was supposed to be an um, active document, not something you stick on mm -hmm. the shelf. And what I'm seeing now is it's become static. It desperately needs to be updated. It was a really good model to start with, but like anything else, you can't just leave it and expect that it's going to be relevant, you know, six, seven years later, which is where we're at right now. Um, the other piece is that uh, $51.9, $52 million was because we had a very conservative, uh, fiscally conservative council at the time, regardless of whether they were liberal or, or not. We were all very fiscally aware. We worked very closely with the Conant administration to save that money it was a good time because the economy was fairly mm -hmm. robust and so we had that extra money and we were very deliberate with what we wanted to do and to invest it back into the community. So it wasn't just that there was this money lying around. You remember this. Oh, yeah. It was that we were very deliberate about let's invest this back in the community and so I want to be sure that we're getting the history right because it was painful at the time. Mm -hmm. We walked through it. We got to a place where we all agreed. I'd hate to see it just languish because that's what I feel like it's doing right now. We have not updated it and it's desperately in need of updating. So that's my pitch to those of you we can that are going to be continuing yeah. on. Don't let this die. Keep it fresh. Go ahead. So yeah. Councilmember Kinnear, I remember when Brian McClatchy was here before he left him and Lisa Gardner were working with the administration on a touch with this and it stagnated and it went nowhere. Yeah. So there was an effort, but it died and then I don't know what happened after that. Go ahead. Because it, it would just be really, as I look at this and I know some of the, some of the items that were, um, a lot of discussion went into, but some of these I don't know, like um, the, Falls utility install, and then there's another three three hundred thousand for the Falls Tower. Where that's at, I mean, there's no. So it'd be great to have that information because I've been sitting here saying to Michael, "Do you know where this one's at, mm -hmm. or where's that?" But it would be nice to know where these Probably. are going. And then how long do we hold the money? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How long does it sit there, and we wait for? And I know COVID had a lot to do with it, so there's going to be a lot of delays, but. That's just well, I, my I don't two know cents. That, I wouldn't say COVID. Ha we passed this well before COVID. Oh, I mean, as far as developers moving on with their developments and, and they, utilizing. This money was pushed out into the community long before right. COVID. Right, so I, right. So I hesitate to always point at COVID and say, it was COVID. This, okay, I'm going to say it's was, you. It was, it was my fault. <laughs> it's yeah. fault. Anyway, that's just my suggestion. Anybody um, else? I'll see Melania. Okay. Well, go ahead. I, I'd just mm -hmm. like a little bit more yeah. clarity on so I don't have to have the monitor of all the ones, but the big ones, I like to know as we budget when those do end because I don't have any idea when those contracts will expire and that money will be reavailable to the general fund. I think that would be helpful as we do some planning. Yep, we have that on our... Is that column? Well, I want to add that column. Oh, you want to add that yeah. column? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. That was informative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anything else? We know where Tanya lives too, so we can ask her <laughs> later. Right, thank you very much, Ms. Walls. Next up is a real estate excise tax fund conversation. Is this a true conversation or are you gonna be doing a? I'm doing a PowerPoint. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's an educational opportunity. Oh. Uh, yeah. That one. So I just wanted to, um, after we had this discussion about using um, REIT for homelessness, I just, just wanted to go over sort of how REIT works and how it's traditionally been used and why you sometimes see balances in that account. Um, it doesn't mean it's not planned. So, I mean, really, this is a discussion. I, I'm hoping that we just provide you some information that you can use going forward. 
So what is REIT? It's an excise tax on real estate sales. The state tax um, exists, uh, it's, it's over 1%, it depends on the value of the sale, what the state um, actual rate is. And then there are two local option taxes, which is what we care about, both at a quarter percent. So REIT 1, they're very similar in their definitions, are for capital projects and maintenance. REIT 1 actually has a broader definition of capital projects. And then REIT 2 is only available to city and counties who are in compliance with GMA and are fully planning under GMA. Um, but also for capital projects and some maintenance. In Spokane, we have used REIT as a traditional funding source for streets. So um, REIT 1 is primarily um, used for street department <coughs> activities, projects to repair and construct streets. And REIT 2 uh, is put into um, primarily into the arterial street fund. Um, it can support other capital projects, which we did when, um, since REIT went up in the last couple years, and we'll talk about that. So I'm going to take you back to 2014, um, and our citizens uh, approved um, a 20-year arterial street plan. We were replaced, um, uh, we had st the street bond that sold in 2004, and we had uh, done 10 years worth of projects, but we had 20 years of debt. And so we refinanced the debt. We created um, a levy for the same cost per thousand. We stretched out the debt to go to 2034 and created an investment in our street system, and that included the levy. There were three components to that, really the maintenance, keep the good street good, manage the poor streets. We do these integrated streets, full rebuilds, like you saw on East Sprague and North Monroe, downtown on the Lincoln Monroe corridor. Those are the kinds of inter integrated street concepts. And then we also have sort of this flexibility in what to do when things don't fit into these buckets very easily and how we have sort of these incremental solutions. Our goal is an average pavement rating at the end of this of 70. Um, to get to that promise to the citizens, we, um, we anticipated using levy dollars, a match from the utilities of $5 million, um, federal and state grants, obviously, but also REIT, you can see in that column. It's just a clip from a, a slide from a, a long time ago. And um, it, what I can tell you is the levy's not growing at the same clip as we anticipated then. Um, we're, we owe you a, a, a mid, uh, a 10 year review in 2024, so we'll do that. Then we're gonna focus today on REIT. Uh, the utility match also was held static at five, so REIT is helpful because it does grow um, over time, although it's quite volatile, as we'll discuss. Um, so our community supported this concept. Um, you know, we asked yes for parks, yes for streets, and um, we had a 77.6% yes vote, which is pretty impressive. Um, um, when was that? Uh, in 2014. And so that was our levy for improved and integrated streets. And um, so because REIT comes from tra uh, real estate transactions, the amount raised annually is, it does really go up and down. It depends on both sales volume and, and value. And so in 21 and 22, REIT was very strong. Uh, Kevin told me that the high year was 21 and it was probably six and a half million dollars for, for each of those REIT components, <coughs> right? Because it's the same amount, it's that quarter percent. Um, in 2023, REIT has been generating significantly less. Um, we're on pace right now to uh, have a year at about $4.4 .4 million. So, you know, per, per REIT. So when you, when you look at that, that it's a several million dollar swing. Um, and so we do try to budget REIT on a more even basis to sort of weather those ups and downs. Um, for 2023, as you know, 35% of available REIT could be used for homelessness support, which is what you approved on Monday. So I'm just gonna kind of go over this. Um, there was some uh, question about that opening balance. And so um, Kevin Zollinger in accounting, who works for Kim, um, provided us with opening balance numbers that were revised um, yesterday. And so he's, uh, the, for REIT 1, the opening balance was 8.3 million. We're currently on pace for that 4.4 million. It could go up a little bit. REIT tends to, generally speaking, collect more in the second half of the year than the first half of the year. Uh, I, I guess people buy houses in the summer and the spring, and then the, that kind of is a trailing indicator. So it, we, could, we could actually surpass that 4.4 a little bit. Um, there's the 4.7 million that um, is anticipated for homelessness at this point. Um, and so the street department, We've, um, in recent years, provided $4 million out of REIT 1 for those street department projects. 
Um, there's only $2.9 million available for the street department. We'll have to backfill that with REIT 2. Um, and then you can see these other non-public works projects. Um, so effectively, when REIT was coming in stronger, we used some of that to pay for some asset management projects like the roof on this building. Um, so, uh, and then when we moved again another amount of money into to homelessness assistance, we've, we effectively double budgeted the excess REIT at this point. So that's what we're seeing here um, with a, a zero balance forecast at the end of the year. Like I said, there's a little bit of play potentially in, um, in the revenue. And then with that opening balance, um, 4.7 is you know, sort of the wag right now, maybe for 2024. Again, we'd have enough to put $3.1 million into streets instead of the traditional four. We'd backfill that with REIT 2. And then there's some lagging um, work on those non-public work projects. So that leaves us again at zero for REIT 1. Um, at REIT 2, our opening balance for 2023 is 14.2. Projected revenue, again, that 4.4 million could, could vary a little bit. Um, for homelessness, we did uh, allocate a million dollars out of REIT 2 for homelessness for the capital project at TRAC. Um, and then there's the backfill for the street department projects. We have $14.5 million in budgeted for capital improvement projects um, in REIT for 2023. Some of that is flexible spending, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So if we were to spend all of that money, we'd be at a $2 million ending fund balance. Um, we'd have start that with 2024. Again, there's some projected revenue, nothing anticipated for homelessness at this point. Um, the backfill from the previous phase for the street department. And then we have planned $8.2 million in capital improvement projects, with a, which would take us to a, a negative balance. So let me talk about flexible spending. So um, we do anticipate at times that we're going to have needs, emergent needs that come up. Um, we have uh, bids that come in higher than we anticipate. REIT is a great source of funding for that volatility in our street system. Um, we also try to, um, if we don't hit on a grant, we don't want to let money sit around and wait for the next year for when that grant might come in. We like to put it to work. So um, that's the other thing that we're trying to do is to be able to continue to put money into the system. So. If we don't hit on a grant for a bigger project, we try to then put money into uh, continuing uh, the list of grind and overlay work that Clint maintains um, and put money into those projects. And sometimes that requires a little extra REIT to get some of that done and then still have the ability to come in and do that capital project that, that didn't get the grant. So, so we do have some, some play in these numbers. I do not actually anticipate that we'll go below, um, that we'll end negative, but I just want you to understand that that's what this is, is really kind of a fluid source and it works pretty well. Thank you, Council are Member. You, are you gonna talk a little bit about the, the, the practical or, or real impact of the 4.7 and kind of how that maybe affects existing projects or, or forthcoming right. projects? Right, so, so right now, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll end up in the black, but what we try to do is really collect the 2023 amount and not spend it until 2024 because it's such a volatile source. So, I, I mean, we started this year with a $6 million budget for REIT. We, we're not hitting $6 million. So, so that's kind of where it, it ends up. Because we had some flexibility, what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll back some of those flexible projects. We will not put extra, a lot of extra projects into the community as we had hoped over the next two years. We do have a long list of projects that, that Kevin and Nick provided to me. And remember, REIT is like small pockets of money for lots of projects because it ends up being the grant match. It ends up being the grant match for a study. Um, so we do those kinds of things over time. But are, are the bulk of those projects actual community projects, street projects, or are they a lot of like asset management the, and things like their that? Bulk, the bulk of them are street projects. So okay. um, part of Post Street, part of Thorough Freya, Garland Pathway, Illinois Grind and Overlay and Shared Pathway, the Pacific are, Avenue Greenway Are study. you saying these are at risk? No, I'm saying okay. that okay. this is where REIT's going. REIT's going into... Okay scores of projects. I literally have two pages of projects where there's some REIT going into them. Um, and Safe Route to Schools, there's a project near Bemis. I mean, so we're, we use those. Um, and, and what we know about REIT 
is yes, it's volatile, but it's also pretty flexible. So um, bike and ped projects, for example, the levy, we really did talk about street conditions with our citizens. What does the pavement look like, whether that's for bikes or, or for cars, but the pedestrian projects off of that or the separated trail projects, REIT is a much better source because it doesn't, it, it, we didn't make that, we, we set aside levy for pavement conditions. The, the, the end result is a 70 pavement rating. So in this case, if we're doing trails off, REIT is a really great matching source versus levy. So we, we use that a lot. Um, projects take small amounts to get through the design process, process, but then we need a match that's a little bigger for, uh, for the construction. So REIT helps us with that. Um, and we have great unpredictability in the bidding environment right now. So we had some really good bids at the beginning of the year. Our bids are not so good right now. And that happens sort of cyclically, but also the cost of construction has still been really up and down. Um, the availability of labor for our contractors has led to different costs. So, so we, we try to keep some REIT set aside so that we can, uh, we can accommodate those changes that we're, we don't know. Um, and we also want to respond to emergent concerns. If you recall, we did come forward and say we're going to use some of those flexible dollars to pay for the additional amount for the South Suspension Bridge in the park. And so that's where $1.4 million is going. Strong road, doesn't score well. We're, we're, the, the ability for us to get a grant really to fix strong road is it's going to be really tough. In the meantime, we have this heavy maintenance project that will happen this year, and that's a million dollars that's going to happen out of that flexible REIT fund. Washington Stevens Bridge Deck is another one we haven't been able to hit on that, but if you drive across the Washington Stevens Corridor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so that's going to happen next year with, with REIT dollars. And so we're, this is what we're trying to do. And so our concern is not so much that this particular spend on homelessness is going to make or break REIT, but it can't be if we're going to meet our commitment to the citizens around streets, we have to continue to prioritize streets for REIT funding over other projects. And that is my concern, and that is why I really wanted to talk to you today. Um, you, you know, 3.9 I was expecting, 4.7 was a little more than I wanted, uh, because I, we like to have that, that um, ability to deliver what we promise to citizens. And my bigger concern, though, is that we don't see REIT as a way to fill holes all across the system, because then we will fail in our commitment to citizens that we promised them um, with, the, with their yes vote on the levy. So I'm happy to answer any questions. We're going to monitor closely REIT spending and yes. Council 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 Cathcart then Bengal. I just want to see a list of projects that are, you said two years we're going to see cuts in streets. So I just want to know what projects that are at risk over those two years. So we're, we back in, we're backfilling in streets with REIT 2 and I do have flexible amounts in here so we will not specifically cut a okay. project. So nothing will get cut. Nothing will get cut at this point. <clears throat> but over time, I, I, this is what I'm saying. It wasn't that I was here to tell you that I'm going to have to cut something today, but that we're limiting our flexibility. And the, the less money we have to play with, the less money I have to go after grants and continue yeah. to keep things rolling, okay. right? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty frustrated uh, with the amount of money that's, that's coming out of REIT, which I'm, I'm sure everybody is in. Um, a similar position, understanding that this is what it's going for. Um, but uh, I actually looking at the at the numbers in here um, felt like when I was being talked to on Monday that there was actually a lot more money in here than there is. And so we might have to go back and, and talk about that a little bit more. But um, I was speaking with Cheryl Stewart from AGC the other day, and she had mentioned that uh, in the state's recent budget that there were no preservation dollars from the state, um, or at least very little. Do you is that accurate? Yeah, you know, so these things ebb and flow, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what um, availability of grant dollars sort of kind of goes with trends, right? So mm -hmm. for a while, we had lots of grant dollars for stormwater. For a while, we had lots of grant dollars for pavement preservation. Um, uh, right now, there's, there's been more for bike and ped as they've moved uh, anticipated Climate Commitment Act dollars in and are funding uh, more bike, ped, and transit. Um, so, so we watch those trends and try to adjust our projects and, and pick out the ones that we think are going to be the most successful. Pavement preservation over the years has always been challenging. It's sort of like everybody likes to pay for the new capital, but nobody likes to pay for the bread and butter. And so um, it, it, that is always a challenge, and she's absolutely right there. But we also know that 
we're really not looking to add a whole bunch of new lanes any place. We're really trying to make sure that um, that, that we have smooth streets, that we, that we deal with the underground infrastructure when we do so we get the best value for the citizens. And rebuilds and grind and overlays really is how we stretch. That grind and overlay is a really um, great tool that we, we stretch the life of the pavement. So when we did the rebuild for the, from the 2004 bond, if we do the grind and overlay and the crack seal and the pothole repairs at the right time, those dollars that we spent to rebuild last so much longer. We really can make streets that last for decades if we do the proper maintenance at the right time and don't allow the surfaces to really get marred up so the water gets in and we have the freeze thaw cycle that ultimately pops it up. Mm -hmm. um, could I ask uh, Mr. Boston to come up? I have a few questions. Don't leave, Marlene. And it has to do with, we have other, other pots of money we have TBD money, we have red light money, and I, I'm trying to get my head around how we could integrate all those different pots to extend and stretch your dollars. So could you address that, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Marlene and I have talked, uh, and um, really at the end of the day, I mean, I think what this this body needs to do is is really determine what the priorities are right right now what we're doing is we have a lot of grabs at all of the different pots of money that we have right we have public safety that's a high priority we have homelessness that's a high priority we have streets that's a high priority um, we're we're throwing an exorbitant amount of money at each one of those priorities uh, but we're not saying hey we're going to tackle that and we're going to do it a hundred percent we, we have the ability, just like REIT, uh, with traffic calming, just like criminal justice, just like all of these different pots of money to uh, look at things and say, okay, well, yeah, we can, we can pull from this for this priority, right? I mean, REIT is a prime example. Criminal justice is a prime example um, where, where it wasn't necessarily laid out within the legislator to, to use those dollars for that exact purpose, uh, but the legislator is giving a little bit of flexibility. The problem that I think, or the challenge that I think that we have had to get to that point is to not talk about this conversation holistically, to say, okay, what are all of our problems? What are all of our priorities? I mean, again, and Marlene and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, saying, okay, we have a 20 gallon bucket that's sitting on the table. We have 25 gallons of water that we have to put into that bucket. If we don't um, decide what the five gallons are gonna, that are gonna be left on the table, then, then we're just gonna be throwing money at things haphazardly and not getting things done the way that we wanna get them done completed and 100%. Um, I, you know, I mean, streets, I, the, the, the REIT fund, yes, it's a challenge, as well as the criminal justice fund. It's, a, it's another challenge that we have because just like REIT, criminal justice will be depleted if we use all of that money for homelessness. Now, we're talking about things and how we're gonna re-strategize things and we're talking about, just like you said, Council Member Kinnear, um, the, uh, the traffic calming and the red light and, and those funds, those can be used for uh, street type capital projects that, that we haven't explored. I mean, we're, we're, looking, at, we're looking at those budgets for, um, different things and and yes are they priorities i don't know that's 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 up for you to decide but and we have to look at each one of those budgets <coughs> collectively with all of those things to say okay these are our top three priorities let's invest a hundred percent in those three priorities until those get <coughs> in, until we can check the box on each one of those um marlene you know is working on uh her her plan that was set out in 2014. So, so, I mean, I agree 100% to to um, subvert some of those those funds to homelessness. That wasn't part of uh, of her strategy when she was looking at this back in 2014. Now, granted, things shift, but we're talking about things isolated. You know, the homelessness conversation was an isolated conversation of talking about, hey, we need to find this funding. Yeah, 4.7, it's not going to make or break. We know that um, while we're looking at capital plan, we know that we normally don't spend 100% of the budget year over year. So there is, like she said, some flexibility in, in those different plans that we have that we're not going to completely bust 
uh, streets and their plan, but if we start doing that on an ongoing basis and say, okay, we're gonna pull at REIT and we're gonna pull it at, at criminal justice and we're gonna pull it this and that and that for all of these sporadic priorities, it's gonna make a challenge for the ones that we've identified in the past and to, to hit those as successful goal, well, goal posts. It's worth noting too that we're gonna be installing 20 additional cameras. So that pot of money is gonna grow and it would be nice to have a plan where we can integrate some of that with some of your projects so that we're not just relying on REIT. And the other thing, too, is I, I would like to look back to uh, perhaps 2014, the, the REIT, what, what was in REIT in 2014, and look forward, is there a trend? So was it going like this? Was it going like this? It would be nice to have those numbers so that we, we're not looking at just three years, but we're looking at maybe 10. Right. Anybody else? Go ahead. Yeah, well, since we're talking about big ideas, uh, I, uh, this was something I talked about four years ago, and of course, COVID and then our financial everything just has made it a hard conversation. But if we're gonna be planning and, and really thinking big about the future, uh, I think we really need to cultivate a much larger uh, residential streets program. And we have a lot of residential streets that literally haven't been touched in 50 years yeah. or more. And, and I think we've got to come up with, with something. And it could include the, the camera revenue. It could include a whole lot of things. But, but I think that's a conversation and strategy we need to put together. And I agree completely. And I, I think Councilmember Kinnear's point is, is well taken. When we started the traffic calming project, it was $700,000 that we were turning into you know, some small things that the, the neighborhoods wanted. Um, the, the list of projects that's in front of uh, for, is $73 million. So, and, and it's, not, it's not repaving. And so, and, and that fund with extra cameras, I don't know, eight, nine, ten million million, $10 million a year yeah. is what that program could. And, and no money right now for, for maintenance of the things that we are putting in for the, in those neighborhoods. Um, and, and I think we need to think about that because when I think about if I could put half of that money into the residential program, that, that doubles the residential program. Yeah. And, or we also looked at um, dirt streets and how long, it'd take 100 years, right, <laughs> or something. I mean, if we, could, if we could take, that's actually serious cash now, the traffic calming program, and we have to decide, I think, whether speed humps are in a neighborhood is more important than actually addressing uh, neighbors who have dirt streets. Because I think when you look about a livability issue, it's, it's much more concerning to me that someone live in front of a dirt street. And so we can argue about how they got a dirt street, but it's 20 or 30 years ago when we didn't require it. And so I, I, there's no way to go back and fix that really in, in many cases. The ones that could be fixed where people were affluent enough to pay for an LID, those are done. Right. Well, we, we got it addressed on Sitka, which is one I'd been mm -hmm. asking for for a long time. Yep. And, and part of the reason was because it was creating air quality issues for yep. the people that live there. Absolutely. You know, for not only for their health, but livability and, you know, mm -hmm. dust all over their house and mm -hmm. yard. And, and so it was a big issue. Yeah, for sure. Who else? Remember, this is a discussion. Go ahead. Yeah, to go to the, like, big picture ideas, the, um, I think some of the, a lot of these projects for traffic calming and all of these projects are great. Um, but I think they are very costly and we should be looking at the cheaper options of things. So looking at sidewalks that aren't a half a, a million dollars, but rather like taking wheel stops and bollards and creating a, a surface out of a large right-of-way street and creating a, a walkway spot or curb bump outs that are more uh, bollards and other types of with painting and stuff like that that are much cheaper that way we can stretch the dollars a lot farther for some projects that can do that, whereas other projects where you're redoing a street or putting in a light or redoing stairs or something like that, there are no cheaper options. So I think we gotta talk about that because a lot of these projects that the neighborhoods are coming to us with traffic calming are very costly for sidewalk or curb bump outs and stuff like that when there are cheaper options around that. And yeah, if we can package can... them more as a funding source for things that we're seeking grants for, that's another way to do it too is you know when we package um, sidewalk infill with a street project, that's less expensive. You're mobilizing once rather than when you're just doing the block of sidewalk. So, so there's ways that if we can start looking at that as a, as a funding source that adds into 
our comprehensive program and allows for some maintenance of the things that we're putting in. We all know that we could do more work on green area maintenance. We put in green area as part of things like traffic calming and improvements uh, on corridors, and then, and then we don't do a great job on the other end. And so if, I'd love to have that kind of conversation, mm -hmm. which is how do we put in the things that make the most impactful difference and how do we take care of it going forward? Yeah, I would just say, you know, on that on that pot of money, just so long as we're, um, yeah, being mindful of what people have understood those, you know, dollars to be used for, and make sure that we're not doing something completely um, out of left field, but uh, just make sure that we're, we're mindful of how we're using those dollars there. And I, I think that's why I asked for that 10-year look, because yeah. I don't, I want to see the trends over time, not just three years. Yeah, so, I, can, I can get a, a look yeah, at That would be really helpful. Anybody else? Go ahead. And, and I'll just remind us all that none of us plan for this homeless issue that we're facing and the opportunity to use that REAP money that was given to us by the legislature to make those kind of decisions. That's just through this year. So that's just uh, as much as, as painful as it is, on one end, it has helped us on the other end, but it kind of made us wake up and pay attention as to what do we need to do next. Right. So my my goal here wasn't to tell you the sky was falling. Oh, and, it was and, just and, to provide you with context. Right. And, and, and I knew that, mm -hmm. uh, Marlene, but I just wanted to you know, remind us, like, yeah. thank you. We need to have the conversation. It needs not to be in a silo because some of us know and some of us don't know really what the whole scope is going on down there. <laughs> And what's coming before it. So thank you for that. Anybody else? I think this has been a great conversation. Um, thanks for the PowerPoint. Yep. And let's not end it here. Let's Absolutely. stay connected and receive updates and meet regularly so that we can have a carve a path forward with um, Mr. Boston's help too. I would very much appreciate that. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, we are at the end of our agenda. Our no meeting on Monday. Don't don't show up here on Monday. Uh, next meeting is next Thursday. Just another study session. So um, have a great weekend. Enjoy um, your day off, and we'll see you next Thursday. Thanks. Great. We're adjourned. Uh, AWC. Next week.